The Hat by Paul Jennings. I'll jump, I screamed. I will, I really will, I mean it. I stared down at the water, churned up by the ferry's huge propeller. Would I fall straight on top of those terrible blades? Would I end up as just a brief red smudge in the ocean? Would I really jump? Or was I bluffing? Dad didn't know. Don't, Jason, please don't, he said. Then stop the ferry, get my hat. Most of the passengers were tourists on their way to look at the coral and fish of the Great Barrier Reef. They stared down at this real-life drama with wide-open eyes. Let him jump, said a man in a Hawaiian shirt. Soaking will do him good. It's only a hat, said the captain. Not going back for that. Time's money. So I should have hung on to it. It's his mother's hat, said Dad. She died three weeks ago. He's not himself. I stared at the Akubra hat, bobbing away in the distance. It was upside down floating like a tiny round boat. Soon it would be out of sight. Sorry, said the captain, but we're running on tight margins. Can't stop every time a hat blows overboard. Happens all the time. I let go of the rails with one of my hands and dangled out over the sea. I'm going, I yelled. I'm going to swim back and get it. My father slowly took out his wallet. How much? He said to the captain. Hundred dollars, said Dad, just for a hat. He shook his head slowly as the ferry disappeared across the water. While we walked along the rickety jetty, I hardly noticed the swiftly flowing river. It made its way to the ocean through the mangroves and the wide muddy beach. Even the splashing of rainbow-coloured fish in the swirling water failed to interest me. I hardly saw the crabs as they scurried into their holes at our approach. Normally I would have been racing around checking out everything. Sorry, Dad, I said. I really am. But Mum loved that hat. I feel close to her when I wear it. I grabbed the wet brim of the wide stockman's hat and pulled it firmly down to my head. Dad didn't answer. I guess that he didn't like the mention of Mum much. He probably didn't like her. She certainly hadn't liked him. I was never allowed to visit him on school holidays, and Mum would always say, It's him, when Dad phoned. She had a special way of saying him, which sounded as if she was talking about the most horrible person in the world. I didn't really know Dad, my own father, and now I was going to live with him and spend the time in this small camp in the rainforest, checking on the wildlife and making sure that tourists didn't camp in the national park or shoot native animals. He was a park ranger. That was his job. Dad put his arm around my shoulder. Come on, he said. I'll show you something special. We walked past the main building with its wide veranda and across the lawn which swept down to the water. Don't swim in the estuary, said Dad. There's crocodiles. I gave a shudder. I hate crocodiles, I said. Dad pointed across the river to a patch of sunlight between the trees. Jeez, I gasped. It's huge. Yep, said Dad. He's big and he's fast. They can beat a racehorse over a short distance. What do you do if one chases you? I asked. Run like hell, but not in a straight line, said Dad. They're not very good at turning. It slows them down. I wonder if it's seen us, I said. As if in answer, the huge beast opened its jaws in a yawn. Then it slid silently into the water and disappeared. We stopped at a small hutch surrounded by chicken wire. A fine mesh wire fence surrounded it. It was strong and well made. Not even a mouse could sneak into the enclosure. Dad unlatched the gate and we stepped inside. The hutch reminded me of Ralph, my pet rabbit, back home in Melbourne. I had to give him away when I left. Rabbits? I said excitedly. No way, said Dad. We shoot rabbits up here. They're pests. So are the pigs. And feral rats. He said the word rats with a disgusted look on his face reminded me of the way that mum used to pronounce the word him. He opened the top of the hutch and carefully took out one of the most beautiful creatures I'd ever seen. The hard look fell from dad's face. He reminded me of a mother staring down at a newborn child. This, said dad, is an eastern bilby, a native animal. It's meant to be here, but bilbies are on the edge of extinction, killed by introduced animals brought in from overseas like pigs and cats and filthy feral rats. It was a beautiful animal, about the size of a rabbit, with a pointed face and long ears that seemed too big for it. Bilby's nose made it look like a stretched mouse, waved its furry tail slowly from side to side. It sniffed Dad's skin, like a pet. Dad placed the bilby in my hand and smiled. There are only two of this species left alive up here, male in the zoo in Brisbane, and this one. She's pregnant. Her name is Breeze, I'm trying to introduce them back into this forest. The feral rats and pigs have wiped them out. It's a battle, I can tell you. His face looked weary. I'll help you, Dad, I said. He grinned at me. His weather-worn brown skin broke into friendly wrinkles. He suddenly pulled the brim of my hat down so that it covered my eyes. 
Come on, Jason, I'll show you around. From inside the hat, I can hear him laughing. I didn't like him touching Mum's hat, but it wasn't the time to say anything. Nothing would part me from my hat. I'd have jumped off that ferry to get it if they hadn't stopped, even though I couldn't swim. That night, I lay alone in my room on the veranda and listened to the sound of the forest. The air was warm and only a fly screen protected me from the dark outside. I left the light on. It made me feel a little safer. The ceiling had paintings of small green lizards scattered across it. I wondered if Dad had put them on there, especially for me. It looked like wallpaper. In the darkness of the rainforest, the sounds outside seemed incredibly loud. I was used to trams rumbling down Barker's Road in Melbourne. At night in the city, I would never even notice the sounds of squealing brakes and a blaring police siren. But here, in this wild and lonely country, every rustle seemed to hold a threat. Suddenly, the wallpaper lizards began to walk. I screamed. They were real and walking upside down on the ceiling, clinging to the paint with little suction cups on the ends of their spidery toes. Dad raced into the room, began to laugh. You sure are a city boy, he said. They're geckos. They can't hurt you. They're lovely creatures. Dad turned off the light. It attracts the mozzies, he said, as he gently closed the door. Mum's hat dangled from the bedpost. I could see its dark outline in the glow of the huge, soft moon. A tear ran down my cheek and soaked into the pillow. Mum, I moaned to myself, please come back. I grabbed her hat, pulled it down over my face to keep out the silent dangers of the night. The hat still smelt of Mum. Even its soaking in the ocean hadn't been able to take that away. No one would ever get that hat away from me. I would go to my grave before I could part with it. Those and other sad thoughts circled in my head till finally I fell into a deep sleep. BLAM! I sat up right in terror. What was that noise? The slamming of a million doors at the same time. The snapping of a giant tree. I heard the sounds of a struggle and scrabbling feet, and then... BLAM! Now I recognised the sound, even though I'd never really heard it before. Not in real life, anyway. Shotgun. Someone had fired in the middle of the night. Footsteps approached. Sorry, Jason, said Dad's voice. A ruddy, feral pig. But it's okay, I got it. I shoved on my shoes and staggered outside. Underneath a curtain of hanging vines lay a huge black pig. Its body still steamed with the warmth of its lost life. I gave a shudder. This place was so brutal. On the one side there was the love of bilbies and crocodiles because they belonged here, and on the other side a scorn for pigs and rats because they didn't. I'm feral too, I said. I don't belong here. No, you're not, said Dad. Feral animals are killers. You and me, we're the protectors of the weak. Dad put his hand on my shoulder and squeezed it. I knew what he was saying, but there was nowhere else to go, so I'd better get used to it. The next morning, Dad raced into my room before I was fully awake. Quick, Jason, get dressed, something's happened. What is it? Three baby bilbies have been born. Terrific, I yelled. Yes, said Dad, but there's something else. His face was grave, and he was worried. I followed him outside. We both stared down at the damage to the closure. The gate had been flattened, and the wire mesh pulled off. The mesh had been twisted into a long rope and dragged off into the forest. Who did it? I exclaimed. Not who. What? said Dad. The feral pig that I shot. I thought it was making a lot of noise. Pigs have enormous strength. Fortunately, it didn't get into the hutch. The bilbies are safe. What are we going to do? Have to get some new wire, said Dad. And quick. The pigs won't be back in daylight, but nothing stops feral rats. He pointed to a patch of tall green grass that stood out against the brown dirt. Saw a rat there a couple of days ago, he said. I just trailed off. Go to your mother's funeral. What do you want me to do, I said. Stay here while I take the dinghy along the coast to the next ranger station. There's a roll of new wire there. I'll be back before dark. Oh, no worries, I said. Can I see the babies before you go? No, sorry, Jason, said Dad. But they mustn't be disturbed. The mother has a pouch. They're safe in there, nice and warm with mother's milk on hand. All you have to do is make sure nothing goes in or out of the entrance to the hut. Breeze will stay there. There's food and water inside. What about me? I said. How long will you be gone? I'll go and get you something too, said Dad. But you mustn't leave the spot. The rat will be in and out in the flash. I can smell a new birth a mile off. Babies are the first things they eat. A bilby has no defence against rats. I would move Breeze up to the house, but I can't risk disturbing her. Oh, you can count on me, Dad, I said. Nothing will make me leave here. I grinned up at him from underneath the brim of my Akubra. Dad nodded. He came back with a bottle of drink and some sandwiches, and a crowbar. What's that for? I asked. If you see a rat, said Dad, you know what to do. 
I shuddered as he leaned the crowbar against the hutch. Okay, I said hesitantly. Good man, said Dad. Should be back in three or four hours. He walked down to the jetty and started the outboard on the little dinghy. The putt-putt of the engine drifted across the water as he headed out to sea. He finally vanished around a headland. For a little while I could still hear the sound of the motor. Then it faded and died. I was alone. The ground began to return the heat of the rising sun. The only sound was the occasional buzz of a fly. It's funny how the bush has different sounds at different times. In the morning and evening the birds are noisy and life fills the forest. In the night there are sounds of secret hunting and feeding. In the hot hours all is quiet. I began to grow drowsy, took a few mouthfuls of water from the bottle, nibbled at the sandwich. I shook my head, trying to keep myself awake. Time passed so slowly. should have asked Dad for a book. For a moment I thought about racing over to the house and getting one, but I promised not to leave the hutch, even for a second. Then the weather began to change. Clouds covered the sun. A tropical breeze sprung up. Without any warning, a fierce gust of wind swept through the clearing. It snatched my hat and sent it bowling towards the river. My blood turned to ice. In a second it would be gone. Could I follow it? Could I not follow it? I'd only have to leave my post for a few seconds, but those words, leave my post, sounded dreadful. Weren't soldiers shot for leaving their post? But this wasn't war. This was a boy in a hat. Nothing could happen to the bilbies in that short time. I jumped to my feet and pelted after the hat. It was spinning like a crazy, out-of-control wheel on a racing track. Oh no! I gasped. A gust carried the hat into the air. In no time, it was in the water, floating quickly away from the muddy bank. I jumped in after it. The mud was soft and I sank up to my knees. In a flash, I realised I was in danger. I tried to lift one leg, but straight away the other one sank deeper. The mud was foul and squelchy. It sucked at my legs. My hat was spinning upside down in the water, just out of reach. The word crocodile flashed through my mind. Panic began to well up in my throat. Then I looked at my hat. My mother's smiling face appeared in my mind. I threw myself into the water, and like a dog digging a hole, I began to pull myself forward with my hands. I stretched out and reached for the brim of the hat. With two fingers I managed to just nip the edge of it, I pulled it gently towards me. Yes! Got it! With one muddy hand I jammed the hat into my head, and began crawling towards the shore. I reached the bank, and ran panting back to the hutch. Nothing changed. Or had it. I looked at the small entrance hole. Were the baby bilbies and their mother safe inside? Had something slipped in while I was away? I listened. All was quiet. Too quiet. Was there a feral creature in there? There was only one way to find out. Dad had told me not to look at the bilbies, but I had to know. Were they safe? I lifted the lid and stared inside. Breeze was dead. Her staring eyes did not see. They were dry and milky. I bent down and gently lifted up the still body. Her fur was sticky. Her little legs felt as if they would break if I tried to bend them. One foot had been chewed. My head seemed as if it had dropped off and was falling down, down, down into a deep well. This was a nightmare. I deserted my post and the enemy had crept into the camp. With trembling fingers I began to search for a pouch. Maybe the bilbies were still alive in there. I turned her over and felt in a fur. No pouch. No pouch. Oh yes, there it was, facing backwards. It was torn and bleeding where teeth had ripped at it. I felt gently inside with my fingers. There were little teats, but nothing else. My heart seemed to stop beating. The world grew bleak and cold. The babies were gone. I knew at once they'd been eaten by the rat, killed before we could even give them names. The rat was a murderer. It had scurried off to its stinking nest and I knew where it was. Red hot rage flowed through my veins. I'd never experienced anything like it before. My whole face was burning. I opened my mouth and screamed in fury at the sky. The sound filled the forest for a few seconds and died away. My skin was cold, but inside I was boiling. Something had taken hold of me. Something inside wanted to explode. It was hate. Hate for the filthy, stinking piece of vermin that could eat three baby billies. The rat's image scurried, red behind my eyeballs. The whole world seemed red. Even the one long patch of green grass that sprouted like an island in the dry house paddock was the colour of the sun. I grabbed the crowbar that was still leaning where Dad had left it against the hutch, staggered towards the patch of grass. It's funny how something so healthy and strong can grow out of a foul bog. The grass was lush and moist, even though it was the dry season. I hardly noticed the stench. My boots squelched in the brown soil. Somewhere in there was a hole, a home, a hideout for the rat that had killed Breeze. I parted the grass with furious sweeps of the crowbar. Bubbles plopped and released nauseous gases, but I hardly noticed. 
Yes. Yes. Wet, oozing hole. I shoved the end of the crowbar into it and jabbed in and out with furious shouts. Die! 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 I shrieked. The end of the crowbar struck something hard. Maybe a rock. I started to dig, but the crowbar wasn't wide enough to lift wet soil. I grabbed a large tuft of grass and began to pull. It was firmly lodged, but slowly it began to loosen its grasp. It came away with a huge ball of soil dripping from the roots. There, the concrete pipe. I couldn't see the end, but something told me a rat was inside. I struck furiously with the tip of the crowbar, again and again and again. Small chips and sparks flew into the air. My hands grew red raw, and a blister formed on one of my palms. Chip, chip, chip. I banged and banged and banged, striking with a fury fueled by my red-hot hate. Finally, a round crack appeared, like the lid of a teapot that had been glued in place. I tore at the broken concrete with bleeding fingers. Ah! I fell backwards into the bog. My jeans and shirt soaked up the foul water. I floundered helplessly. A huge rat had jumped out of the pipe. It was black and fat and squeaking, and even worse, it was only a metre away from my face. It suddenly began to jump straight up and down, as if cornered. I was suddenly grabbed by a wave of fear and revulsion. I wanted the rat to run away, but it was protecting something. Its lair meant more to it than its life. Life is nothing to a rat. It had eaten Breeze's babies as if they were no more than scraps of garbage. The world turned red once again. I sprang to my feet and began striking crazily at the leaping rodent. It jumped up and sideways and then forward, baring its teeth like a dog. Suddenly it grabbed the end of the bar and began to crawl along it. I thought of its claws and teeth and scabby skin made me feel faint. I dropped to a crouching position and holding the bar parallel to the ground, thumped it down. There was a small, sickening crack. The rat twitched and lay still. I stood up and leaned on the bar. I gasped. The breath was raw in my lungs. I stared down at the dead rat. Its life had gone in a fraction of a second. And in that same moment, hate drained from my frenzied head. I'd never killed anything before. Well, maybe a fly and a few spiders, but not a warm-blooded animal. A mammal, even a rat, is more like a person. It has eyes and ears and skin. It holds food in its paws and chews like a human. It has blood inside. It gives birth and suckles its young. Suddenly I felt weak all over. I killed the rat, but it didn't make me feel better. Its dead body reminded me of Breeze, lying stiff and still in the box not far away. Now I was a killer too. I had my revenge, but revenge isn't sweet. Revenge is sour. Inside the pipe, I could see grass and straw and bits of chewed up paper. The rat had been protecting its nest. My heart slowed. The blood seemed to run backwards in my veins. I carefully moved the top layer of grass from my crowbar. Please, I prayed. Please don't let there be. It's funny that moment when you realise you've just done something terrible. Something you cannot take back. A deed that you can't undo. You remember. And it burns into your brain. It stays there forever. Somehow I just knew the rat was a mother. I'd just lost my own. I knew what it felt to be motherless. Pulled apart the straw. There in the nest was helpless, hairless piece of living flesh. The eyelids were still unopened. Thin, veined membranes stretched across its tiny eyes. It moved one leg feebly. It reminded me of a tiny wind-up toy that can only make the same squirming movement over and over again. What do you call a baby rat? A ratling? I don't know. Ratty, I said in a whispered voice. I felt ashamed for killing Ratty's mother. How could I make it up to this helpless creature? I knew what Dad would do. The tiny rat would not last more than a few seconds when he returned, especially when he found out the bilbies were dead. I cradled Ratty in the palm of my hand to keep her warm. I stumbled across the clearing to the house and rushed to my bedroom. I found a small cardboard box and filled it with fluffed up tissues. Then I put Ratty inside. What do baby rats need? Milk. Mother's milk. I didn't have a drop of it. I yanked open the fridge and grabbed some cow's milk. It was cold. Too cold. Poured some into a cup, warmed it in the microwave for a few seconds. Searched in the medicine cabinet, found a small eyedropper. Just the thing I hoped. I drew a few drops of milk into the eyedropper and placed it in the end of Ratty's mouth. The tiny creature sucked. I couldn't believe it. Even though she was blind and helpless, she could still suck. How much should I give it? And how often? After a few drops, Ratty seemed to tire of the effort. Milk ran down her hairless little chin. Goosebumps were standing out on her skin. I quickly covered her up with some tissues to keep her warm. A friendly sound drifted across the clearing. Before I even realised what it was, a feeling of dread ran down my spine. It was the putt-putt-putting of Dad's dinghy. 
I watched him tie up to the jetty and began to drag the roll of wire towards the bungalow. Then he glanced towards the Sibilbi hutch. He dropped the wire and started running. He burst through the door. What are you doing? he yelled. Thought I told you not to leave the hutch. What happened? A rat killed Breeze, I said in a shaking voice, and ate the babies. Why did you leave her unprotected? said Dad. I could tell he was trying to control his temper. My hat blew off into the river, I said softly. I had to go and get it. There was a long, silent pause. Then he exploded. Do you know what you've done? We have one bilby left in the mainland. One. This is the end of the line. There are not going to be any more eastern bilbies. All because of you. Sorry, I said. I'm really sorry, but Mum's hat. At that moment, Dad lost it. He just freaked out. Your hat. Your stupid hat. I'm sick of it. What about all the things I've given you over the years? You can't think about anything else. Breeze is dead. His eyes fell on the cardboard box in my hand. And what's that? Baby rat, I said. I killed the mother and then found her in the nest. Hand it over, said Dad. Now, you know what has to happen, Jason. Her name's Ratty, I said. You're not going to get her. I turned and ran, straight down the beach to the water's edge. Dad was right behind me. He had me trapped. I turned to face him. Behind me was the sea, grey and threatening. The choppy surface gave no hint of the terrors beneath, or beauty. Butterfly fish and rainbow eels, sharks and crocodiles. In front of me was my furious father. The wind tugged at my hat. I made a quick grab at the brim with one hand and pulled it further onto my head. I needed both hands to keep Ratty's box from tipping and sending her into the water. Give me that rat, said Dad. This is no joke, Jason. You've seen what a rat can do. You saw Breeze dead and stiff, her baby's eaten. Ratty's a pet, I said. I'll keep her in a cage. I'll never let her out. I promise. Please let me keep her. This is not a pet, Jason. That's vermin. That rat will never be tame. It will grow up to be a killer, just like its mother. I looked down into the frail cardboard box of the helpless creature squirming in the straw. It wasn't a rat to me. It was Ratty. It had a name. I love her, I shrieked. You're not getting her. Hand it over, Jason, said Dad. He took a step forward. I shook my head, began to walk backwards into the water. Quickly it covered my ankles, and then my knees. Dad followed. This was crazy. The world was mad. Dad would do anything to save a bilby, or a crocodile, or even a snake, because they're natives, and they belonged. But he could kill a pig, or a rabbit, or a cane toad, because they didn't. I knew he would kill Ratty, and deep down in my heart, I knew he might be right. But I was only a boy, and you can't always do what's right. And maybe sometimes it seems right is really wrong. How can you be sure? I was trapped. If I fled out to sea, Ratty and I would both drown. Put the small cardboard box on the surface of the water. For a minute, it floated safely, but then the water began to soak through, and I knew it would sink. I had to give Ratty a chance. I had a choice. A terrible choice. What's more important, a thing or a life? It's hard to decide, even when the thing has a million memories. I put the rat in the hat. Very gently, I lowered Ratty into the surface of the water. An Acubra hat floats. I already knew that. The breeze was blowing strongly offshore. The hat began to move quickly out to sea. Mum's hat. My beloved mum's hat began to bob out to sea. Okay, Ratty didn't have much of a chance. The hat would probably tip over, or a seagull or a bird of prey might swoop down and eat the poor creature. Even if the hat washed up on an island, there was no one to feed a blind baby rat. But a tiny chance was better than no chance. Dad would kill Ratty like any other piece of vermin, that was for sure. Suddenly I heard a strangled cry. Dad looked as if he was about to choke. You cared that much? He whispered. You'd give up the hat? For that rat? I nodded. I knew my eyes were filled with tears. Tears of love and hate and anger. Without a word, Dad bent over and pulled off his shoes. He ripped off his shirt and dived into the water. He began swimming furiously out to sea, towards the distant hat. His arms churned like crazy propellers. Come back, I screamed. Come back! I wanted to go after him, but I couldn't swim. Suddenly, Ratty didn't seem to matter so much. Neither did the hat. Dad was risking his life in the crocodile-infested waters. Was it to save the hat? Was it to save Ratty? What? Now, only one thing seemed to matter. My father. I imagined huge jaws and sharp teeth. Box jellyfish. Nameless horrors. Dad was a good swimmer. His splashing figure grew smaller and smaller until I could barely see him. Come back, come back, I cried. Strained my eyes, trying to understand the story that was unfolding. Yes, yes, he was coming back. And what was that? Oh, he was wearing the hat. That's why he had gone. To save my hat. He tipped Ratty into the water, to drown. 
are just some things you have to face up to. A father is more important than a rat, but Dad was still in danger. At any moment he might disappear beneath the waves. Pulled into the deep, would he end up just as a brief red smudge in the ocean? I bit my fists until they started to bleed. Finally, Dad staggered ashore. Water dripped from his sodden jeans. We stared at each other for seconds that seemed to go on forever. Saved your hat, said Dad. I nodded, sad and grateful. It's okay, Dad, I said. I understand. About ratty, I mean. Slowly, Dad took off the hat of his head. There, tangled up in his hair, was a tiny, squirming creature. Ratty! I screamed. Dad straightened up and stepped backwards. You know, said Dad, when a rat kills a bilby, it's not pleasant. Especially when it steals the babies and eats them. I already know that, I shrieked. Don't rub it in. But I'm still going to let you keep it. Dad bent his head down and let me take Ratty from his hair. For a fraction of a second, our eyes met, using no words, but saying everything. I held Ratty in my fist, trying to warm her up. Dad opened my shaking fingers and stared at his enemy for the first time. He seemed to be going through some terrible struggle. His lips moved, but no words came out. You haven't changed your mind, have you? I croaked. Jason, he cried, this isn't a rat. This is the rat's supper. It's a baby bilby. And if we're quick, I think we can save her. We both turned and ran towards the house. I ran so fast that my hat flew off my head. Just let it go. Some things in life are more important than a hat. A hard bit is figuring out what they are. Well, that's what I reckon anyway.